So welcome to the Knowledge Worker Innovation Series. Uh, this is our first event of 2015. We're pretty excited to get in our third year. And really this event is about bringing the innovation district together, um, talking about really cool things that are happening in Boston, and focusing a lot around um, technology, big data, and that's a topic that's really dear to us. Uh, so this is, uh, I run a lab here, the Data Innovation Lab, uh, and we're hiring, <laughs> and I had to plug that in beginning of the talk. Um, and so we're really delighted to be in this awesome neighborhood with a lot of cool things happening around us, and we're hoping that more and more of our neighbors are gonna come join this meeting. So thank you for being here, and today we're fortunate to have Keith Hopper here, who's just find out a jumbo like me from Tufts. And he's going to speak to us about navigating uncertainty as we launch new products and services. So let me tell you a little bit about Keith. Keith is a lecturer of entrepreneurship at Allen College of Engineering. And he also advises company in early stage agile product strategy. He's a mentor in residence at Techstar, and, which is a global uh, startup accelerator. Keith is also a founding trustee of the revolutionary micro philanthropy, the Awesome Foundation which is even a better name than our lab, uh, which forwards the interest of awesome in the universe through 106 chapters in 25 countries. Prior to that, uh, Keith was the Director of Product Strategy and Development for National Public Radio, and he has a BS from Tufts University in Human Factors Engineering. So if you could please first mute your um, devices and join me in welcoming Keith. So, I'm going to talk about, let me tell a story of two products. When I was NPR, there were two products that we launched uh, that I think are interesting examples of some of the work we did and that tell an interesting story. So one of the products was a very complex platform for launching custom news sites. Uh, it took us about two or three years to build out. The other product I want to talk about was a standalone, stripped down mobile site. It took us like two or three months to build. Um, pretty straightforward. The first really complex news platform by most accounts was a great success. It, uh, it's deployed in about 200 local news markets. It's got thousands of edits a day, probably over a million users at this point. Um, the second product, much simpler, was dead on arrival. We launched it, no customers. We ended up uh, closing down the product line in two or three months. So what's going on? We were trying to figure that out because here we have this incredibly complex project that took so long to complete, so many decisions, uh, significant team involvement, um, and, uh, and it went okay, and then we had this other product we thought was a slam dunk, and it went nowhere. Well, let me tell you about sort of why it didn't go anywhere. Um, essentially what we learned was it required our customers, the mobile site, required customers who were, who were newsrooms around the US to port over their content. It also required them to even understand why they needed a mobile site, I'm not sure why we, if we understood why they needed a mobile site. At the time, they were interested primarily in mobile apps. So essentially, there were a whole number of factors about the mobile site that were unclear to us, or essentially uncertain that we were trying to figure out. We weren't sure of the market. We weren't sure of the needs. Uh, we frankly weren't totally sure of the technology. At the time, mobile sites were relatively new. Um, and so trying to sort of figure all that out played a huge role in determining whether or not uh, it was a success. In fact, we didn't truthfully, accurately figure out all those things. Whereas the other platform was a content management system. Even though it was very complex and there were lots of decisions to be made and a lot of creative investments in it, it was a relatively well understood space. And so this idea of having a particular novel product is sort of packed with uncertainties. In fact, the more novel the product, the more uncertainties there might be across more dimensions, essentially the riskier the product is the project is going to be. So that was a big learning for us. With that was also, uh, what we did is we took essentially the same team and the same methodology in product development and moved it from the product that we were familiar with to the product we weren't familiar with. So essentially what we did is we took a process that we understood and applied it to a completely different problem with the assumption that it would work. And part of the challenge there is, I think we knew, we weren't stupid, this was a, an unfamiliar problem. Uh, so we, we sort of naturally receded into the familiar. So we took a process we knew and tried to do something that we didn't know. Um, 
essentially, uh, that was a, kind of a while ago. We've launched a bunch of products at uh, NPR since then. Uh, I also got to be alongside, uh, see, going on five cohorts now at uh, uh, Techstars, and also have worked with dozens of teams at Olin launching a lot of these uncertain initiatives. And what I've noticed is that um, they're not all failures, right? Some of these uncertainties can be navigated. And so I've kind of stolen the lessons from these teams over the years in determining sort of what's working and what's not working. And essentially, it comes down to this. There are a bunch of uncertainties that you need to turn into certainties. Sounds pretty obvious. But there are a bunch of unknowns. And then there are a couple of or six key areas that I propose that essentially you just have to figure out as you go through the process. So I'm going to walk through these one at a time. So the first is uh, know your purpose. So essentially, uh, it might seem silly at the beginning of a project to ask, sort of, why are we even doing this? What's going on with this project? But it turns out that, uh, that if you were to ask uh, individual members of the team, maybe even executives, I bet you would get slightly different answers, right? You might hear, um, we're trying to solve a specific user problem. We're trying to make the customers happy. We're trying to generate revenue. Uh, uh, we're trying to explore a new technology or a new market opportunity. Um, but the reality is, if the project is all those things, then it's none of those things. And with a project that has so much uncertainty associated with it, you really need one thing that has no ambiguity. And this is sort of the one place where you can nail this. Uh, get a, pro a, uh, a purpose right, and you're, you're taking a huge step in the right direction. So a good step to doing that is essentially having a really clear problem statement. So here's some examples. We're probably familiar with this. Uh, we need to stop users from abandoning our shopping cart. We want more customers to go paperless. Our online advertising rates are plummeting, and we need revenue. It turns out that clear problem statements are kind of hard to get right. One of the challenges with them is you can really limit the possibilities that might be available to you. So for example, this last one, if you had instead said something like, our online advertising rates uh, uh, stink and we need to fix them, um, the team might go and develop a new ad format. But essentially, it would end up being a Band-Aid, right? Because if advertising rates are plummeting and all they do is fix the ad format, then they aren't really solving the right problem. Whereas if with this problem statement, they might actually explore new revenue streams as one of the options to get at that problem. So this becomes ideal when the teams hit a snag, right? So when they recognize that maybe their approach isn't working and they have to stop and reevaluate. If they've got a solid foundation, a solid purpose that they know they're trying to address, then they can look at their approach and go, is this really the right approach for what we're trying to do? And potentially shift that. We're familiar, obviously, with the pivot, which where one foot is firmly placed in something like a clear problem statement, and another foot can move to a new approach. So I wanted to tell a quick story about EdTrips. So EdTrips is one of the startups that I worked with at Techstars, who had a really good understanding of the problem they were trying to tackle. They essentially recognized that there were great inefficiencies in booking grade school field trips. So permission slips, collecting checks, finding venues, it was kind of a total mess. They thought this was a great problem to throw some technology at. So they built a product that was for teachers. Uh, and it tried to make it easier for teachers to book. And they figured out pretty early that teachers were somewhat ambivalent to solving this problem. And the reason is most teachers only book a couple field trips a year. And there's really no incentives for them to make this more efficient. I mean, certainly no financial incentives. Teachers aren't going to make more money if, they, uh, if they're able to book easier field trips. But in their research, they discovered that the venues were extremely hungry for this. Venues, by contrast, were dealing with thousands of disorganized teachers and all these random checks from all over. And venues had a financial incentive, right? They were being gated by the number of field trips that they could book because of all the overhead. So this gave them an opportunity to pivot to venues. So the secret here that I want to point out is not necessarily the pivot, but the fact that they were rooted in a really solid purpose. They knew that what they were trying to address was the inefficiencies in field trips. If they tried instead to have a problem statement around helping teachers, then they would have pivoted in a very different direction. right? They would have tried to solve some other problem that teachers are having. And if they had done that, then the problem that they would have run into is basically jettisoning all the hard work that they had done in solving the field trip technology. They had uh, core infrastructure, they had deep expertise, uh, and they had a bunch of partners already in place, all of which they would have lost if they didn't have that good problem statement to pivot on. So the real secret here to addressing this uncertainty space as it comes to uh, knowing your purpose is it really permits different solution approaches without losing your way. So instead, they can go around the problem, they can go over the obstacle, they don't necessarily need to develop a new road and go shooting off in a new direction. Secret number two, know your risks. 
Um, so knowing your risks, the first step is to, uh, is to try to identify the big risks that are easily avoided. It's, it's a little bit obvious, but, um, uh, but in the case of this, this, this person getting launched off the end of a ramp, like, he should be wearing a seatbelt, right? There's some easy things that you can tackle that you just basically don't want to miss. In the corporate setting, a good example when you're innovating is if you've got a leading experiment and you're out there and you're testing some new ideas, but you also have a brand you're trying to protect, you could go off brand, right? So you can make some pretty easy decisions that don't require significant investments to allow you to, to take those risks or to avoid them altogether. So one of the challenges here is that risks hide inside bad assumptions. So what I mean is that it's not always to easy to figure out uh, all your risks. So one way to do that is look at some of the places that your team may be making assumptions that are eventually proven incorrect. And there are three places to, to essentially look for that. Uh, the first is assuming that customers having a meaningful enough problem and that you're addressing it with the right approach. So that's desirability. The second is recognizing whether or not you have uh, the right resources and capabilities to technically solve the problem, and that's feasibility. And the third is recognizing whether bringing this solution to market makes sense financially for your business, and that's the, the viability place. So here's where your assumptions are hiding um, that you need to go looking. And I'll, I'll, make you, uh, I'll give you a secret that'll sort of shortcut a lot of this. And that's to really emphasize the desirability component. Because when you're building a new product for the first time, that's probably where the problems are at. Uh, technology and feasibility can become important, but they're not really meaningful until you've got something customers actually want. So here are two quotes, one from Steve Blank and one from Paul Graham, that are great because they get right at the meat of it. You know, they really get at the fact that most products fail is either due to, so they're basically due to a lack of customers, right? So the next step, you've avoided the risks you've, uh, uh, you've been able to avoid. You've identified some of the risks that, um, that are in hiding. Now you've got to sort of determine what are the ones that you really want to emphasize. So these represent stickies placed on a board, two axes, one are risk and one is uncertainty. And the reason I put this up here is a lot of people conflate risk with uncertainty. So risk is, hey, if this goes wrong, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shut down our business, right? So a high risk would be, you know, project team is all in an elevator, elevator goes down, right? Huge risk. If that happens, the project's shutting down. But the reality of that is pretty uncertain, right? So not necessarily a risk we need to try to address. On the other hand, something highly uncertain, um, uh, but maybe lower risk is project missing its launch date. I suspect a few of us have had this experience, right? Uh, you get pretty close, maybe you miss it, maybe not by a whole lot. Uh, and unless you're basically demoing at CES, it's probably okay to miss that date. Uh, might cost a little bit extra money, might miss it by a week, but it's not going to close the business down. So high uncertainty, not really high risk. So obviously where you're going to want to look is here. Places that are high risk, high uncertainty. And when you prioritize those items, you're going to want to test your assumptions. So I'm not going to go into this in great detail because there's a really great book like already written about this. Um, uh, but essentially, you know, this is the idea of developing an MVP. Or, uh, or doing an A-B test in order to determine whether or not your assumptions are accurate. The one place I do want to jump in and, and, and make a, a little exception is to talk uh, about what it's like to test assumptions. So I want to know how many folks have sort of deployed a scientific method to try to validate some of their project's assumptions using Lean Startup. OK, so a few of us. You'll probably agree with me. You might not. But I find it like, really difficult to do. Um, one of the reasons it's difficult to do, unless you're doing like a strict A-B test where you're comparing two scenarios to determine which one's the best, uh, it's really hard to design a, a good experiment. You've got so many things going on, trying to isolate variables, trying to make sure that the application is instrumented for, for the metrics that you want to measure, um, uh, being able to understand causality. Like these things are all really difficult but usually required. It turns out, however, that simply getting your product in front of customers uh, or even if it's an early version or a prototype or even just an idea, we'll end up uncovering a lot of assumptions. So there's a lot of benefit to testing, but there's also a lot of benefit to putting your product out there and seeing what you have to learn. So the secret for knowing your risks uh, when it comes to navigating sort of this uncertain product space is letting them unravel early, right? So getting out in front of them either by avoiding the risks altogether, by mitigating the ones that you can, or on by unveiling the ones that, uh, that you haven't realized that you have. So secret number three, know your mindset. Um, at their core, most of these uncertain projects are essentially a search for something that works. Right? So it's a search for a business model. It's a search for a target customer. Uh, it's a search for a set of features. 
And that search, that exploration component, is actually a little bit unfamiliar. Most new product teams or most product teams are staffed with builders, right? People who are thinking about constructing applications, that's usually their job. But depending on where you are, you may actually need to be thinking more about this search and less about the exploration. So I don't know if you can tell here, but uh, we've got a builder in one corner and an explorer in the other, and I want to compare their mindsets for a minute. So the builder mindset is going to be thinking about things like uh, uh, who's their customer, what is it they need, how should they shape their, uh, their solution, and how are they going to talk about it, which conveniently enough is also the things that the explorer cares about. And I think this is one of the reasons that we conflate them. So these two mindsets, or these two types of people actually think a lot about a lot of the same things. Um, the problem is that the builder also thinks about bringing something to scale, the cost of production, uh, safety, a lot of future concerns like reliability, predictability, and maintenance costs. Um, whereas the explorer, their goals, their ambitions, their approach are going to deal much more with things like uncovering insights, developing evidence, uh, answering questions, and asking what ifs. So I'm not trying to suggest one is necessarily better than the other, but the problem is we, we often forget that you have to choose which one to take. And the answer here is essentially trying to figure out where your product is in its life cycle. Are you in a really uncertain space where you have no idea where this product may end up? In which case, you probably want to be emphasizing an explorer mindset. Or do you actually have some key understandings, some key answers, so you can be thinking about building? You know, the mistake, if you're in a building mindset when you shouldn't be, is you're going to be pouring concrete and building walls that you're going to have to tear up later. But if you're in the explorer mindset, you'll be spinning around in circles, just continuing to try to answer the same questions over and over again, where you should actually be picking a direction and building. So the purpose that I talked about a minute ago is really figuring out um, uh, what your destination is and what ultimately you've got, what ultimately what problem you have to solve. Um, knowing your mindset really helps understanding like, what activities you should be working on to get there. So for example, the builder mindset is going to be working on activities to solve building problems. The explorer is going to be in the search for solutions. So the next secret, know your plan. So imagine sort of uh, 18th century, you're sailing a ship from Boston to London. I can tell you a really bad strategy would be to get to the outside of Boston Harbor, set a compass heading for London, and then just sort of go below decks and hope that in a couple weeks you arrive. Um, pretty sure it's not going to work. But uh, uh, instead, um, uh, sailors use dead reckoning, which essentially is the idea of getting an absolute position fix. Uh, and then knowing your direction and your speed over time to determine relative position to that absolute position. Secret here is to take a series of absolute positions. And of course, as you're sailing, small inaccuracies in your measurements, uh, the wind, the currents, they're all going to change your position to what you think it may be. So by taking a series of absolute positions, you can course correct. You can stop, you can, well, to the extent that you can stop in a sailboat, you could pause uh, and look at where you are, where you're heading, what new information you have, and then essentially recalibrate and point in the new direction. This is essentially what you need to do uh, when you've got a highly uncertain product. You need to pause every once in a while and recognize uh, that there are things that you're learning um, and to check what your bearing is on your ultimate purpose and determine if you're still heading in the right direction because at this point you'll have a lot of new information. The equivalent of leaving Boston Harbor with a single compass heading in the project world is the idea of developing a big robust plan. Uh, one that's got specifications and schedules, dependencies and action items and doing all that up front, and then essentially plopping it down, having the team build against a single compass heading, say, build this widget, and then hoping magically in six months at launch date that you're going to have exactly what it is you need. Um, if you're building something extremely predictable, like the next McDonald's franchise, this may work. But, uh, but if you're working on an innovative product, I can pretty much guarantee you it won't. So essentially, another way to illustrate this is the idea that when you set an initial plan and you start building against it, you can deliver a lot of value right away based on your current understanding. But then over time, as your understanding gets farther and farther away from the original plan, the value you tend to deliver diminishes. And I think we understand this intuitively. When we start working on a project, the first few features we build are a lot of the core obvious functionality. And then over time, we maybe start adding some bells and whistles. We start polishing the corners. And the interesting thing is we don't really know where that line is when we've entered into sort of the lack of value area. So there's a secret, and, and, uh, and the Scrum methodology is sort of one way to sort of tackle this problem, is they work for a little while, 
and then they pause. And they pause based on time, because they don't actually know where on the value curve it's right to pause. So they just say, all right, two weeks, we're going to stop and we're going to reevaluate. We're going to basically try to put something in front of customers, and we're going to try to determine uh, what is it we have, right? Are we on track? What have we learned? Uh, and are we still headed towards the destination that we want? And at this point, the team has the luxury of not having to continue to follow the original plan. But they can pause and say, what new things should we be incorporating? Or how should we prioritize what we've already decided we're going to build in order to deliver as much value as possible? So at least theoretically, you get this new surge in value. And then over time, after you've done this a few iterations, you actually end up in a place with significantly more value than if you had stuck with an initial plan. So something interesting about this is that each one of these still has diminishing value. You essentially just pinch it off. Uh, at, that, at that particular date. You don't know when that value is going to stop, but by setting a fixed date, you can sort of force function it. So essentially, the, uh, uh, knowing how to plan the answer to solving sort of the uncertainty around this piece of it essentially allows you to course correct. So this is the idea of replanning. Uh, anyone know? I don't know if you can see this, but anyone know what this picture is? To make a bobsled team, any, you know what year? So it's 2011, not a flake of snow in Jamaica. I think most people know this story, yet they were able to qualify for the Olympics in bobsledding. So one of the most powerful shared values on a team is a willingness to learn, essentially to know yourself. And this is both knowing yourself as an individual, but also knowing yourself as a team and, and how you work together. Large teams, it's hard to do this. So large teams can uh, develop political factions. Uh, they can have difficulty making decisions and their interactions increase exponentially with the number of members on the team. In contrast, small teams develop shared values very quickly, shared values like their willingness to learn. Amazon sets, uh, Amazon.com sets this number, uh, and they call it the two pizza team. I don't know if you've heard this, but the idea that you should set the size of your team based on those that, uh, that you can comfortably feed with two pizzas. So in the four to seven people range, and I definitely have come to believe this is true. So, an ideal way to learn is to use a learning framework and to be deliberate about it. So I'm going to quickly walk through this. In the upper left-hand corner is essentially where you start. The team pauses. They're really looking at their effectiveness as a team as part of this, in my example. And they reflect upon some previous amount of work. And individually, they, just, they, uh, they think about what went well and what didn't go well. And then they take that information and share it together as a team. They identify usually a single improvement. And then they agree that over some set of period of time that they're going to enact that improvement. An important uh, component in this step is to identify the results that the team wants to achieve with this improvement, because then they can go into the last quadrant and assess how they did. And this is pretty critical, stopping and saying, did we actually do the improvement? And did it actually have the results we wanted? So this is pretty obvious, right? Shouldn't we all just like naturally do this? This is how we learn, right? We pay attention to what's going on. We gradually improve. And I can tell you this is like, this isn't actually the way we learn, unless you're talking about conditioned learning, you know, where we burn our hand and over time we learn, stop touching that hot object. Um, we actually have to be delivered as humans. We have to engage our, our frontal cortex. And I think one of the reasons it's so hard to do this uh, is kind of like watching yourself on video, which I assume I'm eventually going to have to do, um, or listening to yourself on an audio tape. It's not something we would choose to do, right? We don't actually want to have to experience that. Obviously, if you have some experience doing it, it becomes easier over time. But that's where a lot of the real learning happens. So there's something interesting that happens. And I can bet you it happened on the 2011 uh, Jamaican bobsled team. So when a team consistently identifies, tackles, and acknowledges their ability to problem solve over time, they begin to have a shift in their perspective. They begin to see, uh, they begin to develop a, a self-efficacy. So there's a belief that they can, they can do things. Um, I've had this, this experience, and, and, and one really interesting thing that happens is it can be applied from small successes to much larger successes. There's a projection that happens. So for example, if a team starts going through that learning loop and discovers that they have to do some simple things like show up for time to meetings and set objectives and agendas, and they start monitoring their ability to actually execute on that, and they actually recognize the results that it's having, and they do this a few times, 
they start naturally believing, whether it's true or not, that they can extend this capability to other problems. In fact, much more significantly complicated problems. So if a team is effective in learning how to work together and is monitoring their ability to do so, they can begin to believe, whether you think this is a good thing or bad, to tackle much more sophisticated and difficult problems. And I can bet that their teams that think they can tackle sophisticated and difficult problems are the ones that do. So just a, a very specific experience that I had with this. Uh, I was on a teaching team this summer whose job it was to develop a curriculum in an incredibly fast amount of time. And so part of what we were doing is try to eat our own dog food. So we were teaching agile and teaching product launching. So we actually set up these learning cycles every day instead of every two weeks or every month. So at the end of every day, we stopped and we said, how did it go today? Uh, what should we improve for tomorrow? And we held ourselves to that. And by the end of the week, I can tell you it was an, it was an amazing change. Like even, even we recognized it, but we had visitors to our room our team room that we're working on that like, didn't even understand what we were doing. They didn't understand the language we were using and the speed at which we were, at which we were moving. And I can tell you the fee feeling was pretty amazing. And it helped me realize that I don't think there's anything special with the team because the kinds of things we were doing were showing up to meetings on time and having agendas. But, uh, uh, but what I recognized is the value that came of it. So I'd encourage you to try this experiment on your own. So lesson six, final lesson. So know how to fail. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've participated and witnessed my fair share of projects that have sort of reached a lull, sort of hit a point at which everybody gets a little disappointed or a little discouraged. Um, and I always sort of wrote this off as uh, team dysfunction, right? Maybe we weren't working well together. Maybe there was somebody on the team that wasn't fitting in. Uh, or I blamed it on you know, an executive bad decision. You know, somebody's making us work on this thing. And I think I've realized over time, especially in working with students sort of who have to crank through these projects incredibly quickly, that this disappointment and discouragement when you're working on risky initiatives, sort of these highly uncertain projects, it's actually the norm. Um, it's almost every team at some point sort of goes through this. And I think I'm not the only one who realizes this. So Paul Graham, uh, who's the founder of Y Combinator, is a napkin sketch, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is his description of sort of what startups go through. So on the horizontal axis is time, vertical axis is emotion. And, uh, and there's this huge surge at the beginning of the project, the tech crunch of initiation, he calls it, quickly followed by the wearing off of novelty and the extended trough of sorrow. Um, there's one of the funniest things here is the releases of improvement is quickly followed by the crash of ineptitude. But this is funny because it's true, right? Um, when things don't go well, it sucks. And when one of our assumptions is proven wrong, it's, it's kind of discouraging. I think the weird thing is that we actually don't talk about this. You know, we don't actually say, this is common, this is normal. This is actually what most teams go through when they run into things that are, are sort of not possible. Um, I think one of the reasons that we don't talk about it is the way we behave when it happens. So oftentimes what happens, and, and I'm watching a lot of students go through this and I'm seeing the patterns in my own work experience, is uh, uh, denial, right? So it's, it's weird, you know, even though I'm frustrated, nothing's going on, there's no problem. Um, Blame, right? Somebody on the team, it's an executive, somebody else, it's not the customer, God, the customer's stupid. Uh, or, uh, or the worst, apathy, right? Like, it's a death march. I've just entered into a project where nobody wants to be here. Um, probably the right thing to do at this point is to acknowledge that, uh, that something went wrong, right? And try to understand what it is. Uh, I think a good thing to do here is to ask why, to try to get at maybe that the fact that there's an underlying problem. The first reaction when a, when a team runs into those challenges is to look at what I would see as the symptoms, right? That sort of surface level problem. We're gonna say, oh, it's such and such's fault, or nobody's showing up for meetings, that's the problem. But the reality is no one's showing up for meetings for, for a reason, right? It's probably, if it's one of these sort of highly uncertain projects, it's probably a good reason, right? It's probably that evidence has begun to emerge that maybe we're not on the right approach. Uh, or maybe sort of that glorious vision of success is looking a little, a little dubious now. And if so, now, now would probably be a, a time to, a good time to revisit the, the team purpose. So another method for addressing failure is to cultivate resilience. Um, I've tried to do this with my classes and it's really, really hard. I think cultivating resilience is, is captured just beautifully in this quote. So uh, one way to do this is by, um, is by celebrating failure. And I know even as the words are coming out of my mouth uh, that I, if we're sitting in the audience, would hear, yeah, like my company so doesn't do that. <laughs> um, 
There are companies that do. They're pretty rare. There's an organization called uh, Engineers Without Borders that publishes a failure report every year. But, uh, and in the startup community, like failure is actually talked about and is definitely part of the culture. But this is pretty rare on a company and a basis, and I realize that. So if you wanted to start down this path, if you haven't already, doing it on a small team, like a pizza team basis, or even an individual basis, is a really good way to start. So celebrating failure isn't just cheering when something goes wrong. Failure, yay! Um, I can think of a bunch of failures that wouldn't be good to cheer, like the not wearing the seatbelt failure would probably be a bad failure to cheer for. So I'm talking about uh, the things that are worth cheering for. So one example would be, hey, we just learned a really important lesson, right? Um, and if that lesson can be tied back into product development, then you've got something to celebrate, right? You're in a situation where you've just learned something really important, and that really important lesson can be baked into the product development activities so that you can ensure the project's going to be a success. And that sounds like something to say yay for. Additionally, when teams get in these learning loops and when they're doing the kind of planning I talked about earlier where you're, uh, where you're frequently replanning and assessing how you're doing, you can actually catch failures pretty early. And that's also worth celebrating. I don't know if you've had this experience, but if you're relatively early in a project, you're days and weeks in, and you just hit something that's like a total landmine and you're able to, uh, even if it blows up the project, you're able to say, hey, we can actually, we just learned something, we can course correct. That is actually worth celebrating too because you potentially could have just kept going, right? You'd be at six months, eight months, 12 months with a product that nobody wants. You just wasted a whole lot of life. Um, the interesting thing is you can see teams that have gone through this transition start by saying a statement like, hey, we just screwed up, but at least we learned. Uh, and that phrase gets sort of inverted and turn into um, hey, we just learned something really critical to the product success, and it only took us a couple weeks to figure it out. So the piece here around navigating uncertainty with failure is essentially knowing how to fail ensures that you get back up. So these are the six that I just walked through. There's something important here. It's not just turning all of your uncertainties into certainties. So the first couple here might be that, right? So knowing your purpose and knowing your risk, that's taking things that you don't really know and creating a mechanism for figuring them out. But the next four are really uh, methods for responding when it is you don't know uh, something, right? What are we gonna do when an unknown or uncertainty arrives that we didn't, weren't able to anticipate? Well, you can actually prepare. Um, here I suggest you prepare your mind, right? So you think about the problems the right way. You prepare your plan, so the way that your team works. Uh, you prepare yourself and your team so you have a mechanism for basically figuring these things out and learn as you go. And you plan how to fail so that when you screw up, you're able to get back up and keep going. So that's, uh, that's everything. My suggestion uh, is to give some of this stuff thought. And if you're interested in the presentation or a paper I wrote about all this stuff, you can download it here. Thanks. So, you know, I think for a startup that may not have a big brand out there, it might be easier, but I'd love to hear about um, an example of how do you get in front of a customer when you're a big established brand, and in our case, uh, like many other big brands, you know, there is this uh, expectation setting that this is not the fully baked out product, but we really want to put something that might actually suck, and um, so how do you manage that? So in my experience, the easy way to manage it is recognize that you're actually not doing a product launch. Right? You're basically just learning. And you can usually do that with a relatively small number of customers. I'm pretty confident that the people that are going to freak out about that aren't going to be your customers. Right? They're probably going to be the people inside your organization, which is one of the reasons to go off brand. I think uh, a good analogy that I have is, um, let's say you have a rug in your office, and people come into your office to visit. Somebody comes in and trips over the rug. They're probably clumsy. The next person to come in your office, if they also trip over their rug, maybe something's going on. The third person comes in and trips over your rug, okay, something's definitely wrong, right? I need to fix this. So my point here is you probably don't need to talk to a whole lot of customers to figure out where, the, where they're going to trip on the rug. Now, you don't need to launch it to 1,000 customers to figure that out. And I would argue that you really don't have a risk in putting out a bad product if you're not putting it in front of thousands of customers. In fact, I think you're going to have the opposite. You're going to have customers who if you reach out to them, like really appreciate being part of the process. Cool. And so the other question I had before I open it to the floor is, uh, if you could tell us more about the Awesome Foundation. Okay, cool, yeah. So uh, how many people are familiar with the Awesome Foundation? 
Okay, it's so four or five. So I don't know if we're still on rotation at the digital billboard over at District Hall, but we were for a little while. Um, let's see. Uh, it got started about six years ago. Me and nine friends were really discouraged by the grant process uh, for essentially applying to get our to build out some of our ideas. And we had lots of friends who had amazing ideas, and essentially those amazing ideas were stuck in their heads. Um, you know, they were always sort of lamenting about. Uh, you know, I should really do this, I should get around to doing this thing. And often the excuse was, you know, I just need a little bit of money for materials or, or whatever. So individually, we couldn't really fund them. Like we could give them a hundred bucks, but, um, but, uh, but we decided, hey, if 10 of us got together and pulled the money, we could give somebody a thousand bucks. How awesome would that be? It's like an extra zero. Um, and we discovered that, uh, that it was a pretty good idea. What surprised us though was that we thought a lot of people would be hungry for the money. Um, they want the thousand bucks to work on a project. And that was true, but there were just as many people hungry to do the same thing in their own communities, to like find nine other friends and give money you know, sort of uh, in the cause of awesome. So we give away a thousand bucks, no strings attached, cash up front, um, which is sort of refreshing for a lot of people because unlike a grant where it requires you sort of defining exactly what you're gonna do and then following up on it, we just say, you know, do whatever your, wherever your heart leads you. Um, our first project was, uh, I don't know if people know about this or saw it, but was a giant hammock on the Greenway about five years ago. Um, it could fit, I don't know, maybe like 15 people or so, and it was pretty amazing. Uh, uh, if you can indulge me, and I can tell you just like one thing about this hammock, which is great. Um, at any given day in the summer, it, well, first of all, a hammock is irresistible to lie in. I, I don't know if you all, I have this experience, but so what would happen is people would walk by and they'd be like, oh my God, it's a giant hammock, I gotta lie in it. And they would get in it. And then at some point the photographers figured this out. And at any given point, there was just, there was like six photographers, several professional photographers like always standing by because there would be a businessman from the financial district, uh, two kids on a school field trip, a Japanese tourist and a homeless guy, like all lying next to each other in the hammock with absolutely like no concern at all that they were lying next to each other. Um, I think that got to the essence of why we like the idea. I don't know that, that we, we thought of that, obviously, when we funded it, but it's just a cool example of the kinds of things that we funded. So what it ended up turning into was, um, it's very, what we call a portable brand. So we, didn't, we don't require anybody to have to do anything to use our brand. So if people want to start their own group of 10 people anywhere in the world, they can do it. They just have to let us know they've done it, and, uh, and we'll add them to the website. And so what that turned into, that freedom to like go and do that and be part of this cool movement, turn into a whole bunch of people wanting to be involved. And so each group gives away a thousand bucks. Most people give away a thousand dollars a month. So like you said earlier, I think we're at a hundred and something chapters in 26 countries and we've given away about $1.4 million. Wow, yeah. that's pretty crazy. It is, it's awesome. It is You're awesome. You're allowed to say it. It is awesome. Thank you. So I wanted to see if there's any questions in the room for Keith. Yes, yeah, so what I've learned is, uh, well the question is, is um, is, uh, if I can try to boil it down, is how do you deal with a team who's, or members of the team maybe, that are uncomfortable with the explorer mindset and want to sort of resort to the, to the builder mindset when maybe exploration is what's, is what's needed? I've definitely experienced that. Um, one thing I've definitely seen, and this surprised me, is a relatively experienced uh, engineer at one point very willingly make the shift to the explorer mindset and, and, and what I came to understand was they didn't want to work on one more project where they would waste six months building something that then they had to throw away. And so they had had that experience and they knew that it, that, that it was worthless. They wanted to make sure that those answers were, were, uh, were addressed before they started pouring the concrete, before they started making these big investments. I think also there's a lot of things builders can do, right? There's that overlap. They care about who the customer is and they care about the needs. And so there's things that they can do to help sort of construct prototypes um, and to be actively involved. So they aren't just sort of sitting on the sidelines. I also think it makes sense having the team collectively decide where are we, right? Is to like draw out the spectrum and say, okay, let's come to an agreement. Where do we think we are? As opposed to dictating it to the team and saying, all right, we're in exploration. One way to do that is to talk about all the bad assumptions you might be making. You've got to, some cultures don't like doing that, particularly like innovation cultures, you know, don't want to criticize uh, you know, new ideas, but I think there's a time and place for it. We need to pause before you start making a real investment and say, okay guys, let's talk about what could go horribly wrong. Like, 
what about this product might people be totally disinterested in? Do we have evidence to suggest that this problem is even worth solving? And have that conversation until you can get the team to a place where they go, OK, we can collectively decide this is where we think we are on the builder explorer spectrum. And there might be actually good building things to do. For example, if some of your risks are, hey, no matter what, we know we need a website, the question is, Maybe we don't know exactly what the user experience is going to be or the exact feature set. You might be able to start building the website infrastructure, for example. Yeah. Um, so you, you gave the example of uh, celebrating failure uh, by like, reframing it. And, you, know, you learn something, and it kind of seems like something you would do on a team. Um, but beyond the, the team, like for the whole organization, how do you encourage that? Mm. You, you gave the one example of uh, a failure report. So yeah. I think it's one of those examples where somebody's got to gut up and do it and, and demonstrate the value in doing it uh, and hope that, that if it delivers on those, on those values that I talked about, right, that we, we, we beat the gun, we didn't like waste a whole bunch of time, or we learned a lesson early and based a successful product on that lesson and can tell that story effectively. There's actually a seventh lesson that I didn't include, um, which, is, uh, which is around being a good storyteller. And I think it's a pretty important part, actually, of navigating uncertainty, which is to be able to talk effectively about what it is you're doing, about all these earlier steps. And, and so I think the answer there is to be able to try it, get some small wins, and then talk about it as an organization. In fact, I think the story um, I got was from a book called Fail Better. Uh, from, that's where I learned about the Engineers Without Borders. And the story there talks about how they sort of organically figured this out. Right? They kept on working on these international initi engineering initiatives that wouldn't go anywhere. And somebody finally stopped and said, like, why are these things not working? Someone's got to just write down what just didn't work and tell the rest of us. And so they started on one project, and someone was like, wow, that's crazy valuable. And then they started doing it more and more. And at some point, a tipping point was hit, and it no longer became like a shameful thing to fail. It became actually something that everybody else could learn from. Yeah, so the question around sort of the curves, like in Agile, when you're replanning, do you find that a different, different customer uh, might be more appropriate? You can. Um, it's always better to, to sort of usually, you know, usually Agile phases are you're, in, you're definitely in building mode, right, where you're creating. You're learning, right? You're learning from your customers. But the hopes here is that you're learning uh, uh, relatively contained things. Um, if you're learning big things like, oh, gee, we've got like the completely wrong customer segment. Although arguably, you could learn like an adjacent customer, right? So this is working for, uh, uh, for you know, stay-at-home uh, uh, software developers. And it turns out that you know, stay-at-home architects, it also works really well for. You know, that's like an adjacent uh, market that might not be a huge leap. But if you learn that you were aiming at teachers and you really should aim at venues, and you're discovering that in the build cycle, um, I mean, that's essentially what happened to EdTrips, um, but their build cycle was relatively early. So it definitely happens. Um, I think the nice thing is to see if you can preempt that, right? If you can get early prototypes out in the field to try to get the answers to those questions. But your point around a new market is definitely, I think, one of those assumptions that gets invalidated. And it falls into that desirability circle. So anything around who the customer is, what the customer problem may be, and what the most appropriate solution for that customer are, all three of those are the most likely to blow up with a new idea. But it's one of the reasons, actually, that, that, that uh, side point, that it's really good to have diverse teams, not just to, to create more creative ideas. But if people think differently, then they're much more willing to question something that just happened. Right? If everybody thinks exactly the same and something goes wrong, then uh, uh, like let's say you've got, um, uh, I don't want to judge, judge. But if you have a whole bunch of people that have the very same skill set, and something goes wrong in the pro project, they might not even communicate to each other that they all think it's the customer's fault. But be, if that's their background, then like, they're all going to think it's the customer's fault. No one's going to stop on the team and say, hey, wait a second. Like, maybe we're not actually understanding where the customer's coming from on this one. But if you have people that think differently, they might not even have to be assertive. They might just ask a question, which is like, why did everybody just assume that, that this just happened? Can you help me understand? And then everyone's like, ooh, maybe. Maybe that didn't just happen, right? So to answer your question, I think, um, I think uh, trying to have it happen in microcosms is a lot easier. And then if you can demonstrate the value of it happening in microcosms by using communication strategies and success stories, then it has the chance, at least, of catching on and, and going bigger. I do think I have seen some stuff happen culturally. 
<clears throat> like in, um, in the startup community. I mean, failure was a dirty word. If you failed in a startup, uh, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, if you had a lot of money, you could just power your way through it. But I think it was hard to, to sort of have the, the gall to go back to maybe even the same VC and say, no, I want you to write me a check again. What do you think about that? And nowadays, that's the norm, right? So I think things, these things can happen um, across like big communities, but it's got to be part of the community conversation. Cool. Well, thank you so much. That was awesome. So please join me in thanking Keith. Thanks, Anna.